On today's episode, China is building a nuclear power plant on the moon, SpaceX has a new Starship launch date, and NASA cuts funding to the ISS. China and Russia have just signed a new deal to build a nuclear power plant on the moon. We know that China's space program has been in talks with the Russians for several weeks, with officials on both sides hinting that a nuclear development was in the works. The power would be required for China's moon base, known as the International Lunar Research Station. Announced in 2021, the ILRS will begin construction in the 2030s and will be a fully autonomous robotic installation at the lunar south pole. From the very beginning, this moon base was pitched as a joint venture between China and Russia, and then mentions of Russian involvement faded in 2022 as the war in Ukraine broke out. But now, it appears that the original plan is back on, with this nuclear partnership being signed during the Chinese president's recent visit to Moscow. While the construction phase of the moon base and nuclear power plant will be fully autonomous, both nations have promised that this is about laying a foundation for their people to operate on the moon. In a statement earlier this month, Russia's space agency wrote, the station will conduct fundamental space research and test technology for long-term, uncrewed operations of the ILRS with the prospect of a human being's presence on the moon. Power will be a critical factor in any longer-term moon base, because the moon has an extended day and night cycle that sees 14 Earth days of continuous sunlight, followed by 14 days of total darkness. That makes solar power incredibly challenging. There is battery storage, but those are heavy, and we know that batteries don't like the cold. When the sun sets on the moon, it gets unfathomably cold. So nuclear is an ideal solution to the lunar environment, and the Chinese could not ask for a better partner in this regard. Russia has significant knowledge in constructing nuclear power plants, as the Russian company Rosatom is currently the world's largest manufacturer of nuclear reactors. That combined with seven decades of spaceflight experience makes them the best equipped nation in the world to actually build a power plant on the moon. The reactor will likely be a cut-down variant of existing plants for ease of construction and transport. They will also need to make some adjustments to the design in order for it to operate in a lower gravity environment, but the core function will remain the same. It's unclear where the fuel for a nuclear reactor will come from. On Earth, they're typically fed manufactured pellets of uranium, which could be sent to the moon on supply rockets. But in the future, these nations could mine their own fuel straight on the moon, as it's been proven there are deposits of uranium across the lunar surface. According to China's plan, construction of the moon base will span from 2031 to 2035, with it finally being brought online in 2026. They will construct the research station as well as the power plant down here on Earth before launching them to the moon in pieces. China has planned for at least five construction missions using the upcoming Super Heavy class Long March 9 rocket, which is the Chinese version of the Starship. However, this timeline seems ambitious at best. No one has ever built a moon base, let alone a nuclear power plant on the moon, and we know what can happen to even the best laid plans. All of this Chinese and Russian posturing comes at the same time that NASA is slashing and burning their own lunar exploration roadmap. The Gateway space station that was envisioned as a pit stop for American astronauts on their way to the surface of the moon is now all but dead, even though large portions of the station have already been constructed. Beyond that, development of NASA's SLS moon rocket has also ground to a halt. The existing boosters are still planned to be used for Artemis II in 2026 that will fly a crew around the moon and back again. Then for a human landing in 2027 with Artemis 3, but that will be the final flight for SLS, if those missions even go forward as planned. A big part of that plan at NASA, both figuratively and literally, is going to be the SpaceX Starship, America's next moon lander, and a rocket that promises to carry the future of human space exploration. But it's not exactly going great either. SpaceX has signaled that they are finally ready to launch their Starship Super Heavy rocket again. It's now been two and a half months since the previous test flight, which ended with the rocket's upper stage experiencing a catastrophic failure in space and returning to Earth as a flaming cloud of debris. 
which was essentially a repeat of the Starship flight previous to that, which also featured a flaming cloud of debris raining down on the Atlantic Ocean. What made those last two flights different from previous Starship testing was the introduction of the company's new design for the upper stage vehicle, Starship V2. As we've seen, there are still some kinks that need to be worked out here, but SpaceX is now feeling confident that the new ship will make it through a successful re-entry. Although the biggest change for this next flight plan is actually going to come from the Super Heavy booster, Starship's first stage. SpaceX will reuse a previously flown booster for the first time. This is the same booster from Starship Flight 7 in January 2025. The upper stage on that mission exploded, but Super Heavy returned for a catch back at the Mechazilla launch tower. And now, after four months of refurbishment, SpaceX believes that the same booster is ready for round two. Since this would be the first time a Starship booster will be reflown, it could pose a significant new challenge. No one knows how it's going to perform, and since the primary goal for this next flight will be getting the V2 ship into orbit and on course for a successful re-entry, the company has made a choice to avoid taking any big risks with the booster. They're not quite ready to find out what happens when you try and land a booster for the second time. So to avoid excessive risk to the ground systems at the launch site, SpaceX will bring this Super Heavy down for an ocean landing instead. This was confirmed in SpaceX's new launch license for Flight 9, which they had to refile with the FAA to account for the change from previous missions. In pursuit of a better outcome for their Starship, SpaceX has invested a lot of time in ground testing with the new vehicle. Ship 35, the third V2 build, has been brought out for static fire testing twice in the past week. One of those tests focused on replicating the orbital insertion burn with the Starship lighting its six engines for about one minute. And that was actually the third time we've seen this particular ship on the test stand. The first static fire that happened last month was really interesting because it appeared like SpaceX was able to push the rocket to failure during that test. We saw a big piece of the engine go flying out from underneath. And that didn't happen on the most recent test fire, so probably a good indication that SpaceX has fixed something. Will it be enough? That's what we're going to find out this month. Initially, SpaceX was promising a launch as early as this week, but it seems that timeline has already slipped. Flight 9 was originally planned to launch on the 21st of May, but new info points to a later date. New notices to both Mariners and Airmen tell us that the Starship will launch on the 26th instead. And while SpaceX is making continuous progress, NASA appears to be struggling just to make ends meet on their own projects. The American Space Agency will make the tough decision to cut their International Space Station budget ahead of its retirement in five years. One significant change that could come under this new policy is fewer missions to the station. This means that a smaller crew will be permanently manning the station, taking the number from seven to only six. Russia would retain their three cosmonauts. However, NASA would begin launching only three astronauts on Crew Dragon missions instead of the four that they have always contracted. Once approved, this would begin next year with the launch of Crew 12 in February. Fewer astronauts per launch will make the ISS much cheaper to maintain in coming years, as they can cut off a fourth of the supplies they would otherwise have to carry into space. Fewer astronauts, however, would also affect the amount of science and research they are capable of aboard the ISS. So why change now when the end of mission for the ISS won't come until 2030? Well, recently the Trump administration has unveiled new budget cuts to all non-defense programs, including some important space projects. This so-called skinny budget proposal will affect the ISS in the same way if approved. This makes it seem like NASA is just preparing for inevitable cuts, which will hopefully make it easier to get ready for 2026 when the new budget would go into effect. This would be the first time that NASA funding for the ISS has ever been reduced year over year, which may sound like a crisis, but the most likely reason for this change actually has nothing to do with NASA's proposed budget under President Trump. In fact, what NASA is probably looking for is a way to redistribute the funds into a new project the deorbit of the ISS. This has led them to contract SpaceX to develop a deorbit vehicle based off of their existing Dragon spacecraft. Now, obviously this is an expensive contract reaching up to 
$850 million, and with NASA's ever-shrinking budget, they were forced to pull this money from current ISS science budgets. However, cutting science projects on the station won't be nearly enough to find even half of the deorbit program's budget. That is why NASA will also be laying off ground teams that monitor the ISS. The Johnson Space Center Flight Operations Directorate and the Marshall Space Flight Center Payload and Mission Operations Division are being asked to lay off at least 50% of their staff. They will also draw out the duration of existing missions to the station, which would now be eight months instead of the customary six. NASA addressed this new plan by saying the organization, quote, continues to review operations and will make future adjustments as necessary to support the space station's needs, crew safety, and maximize science capability as the agency prepares for the station's retirement. This means that nothing is set in stone yet. However, it is clear that some changes need to happen in order to be able to fund both the ISS as well as its retirement plan.